The federal government might just be negotiating with Band-Aid soon if they adhere to the advice of a northern group. And bills seeking the approval of Amotekun has been submitted in several southwestern states. This is Plus Politics, and I am Benny Ark. The Northern Coalition for Peace and Development has asked the federal government to initiate talks with bandits towards ending banditry and other crimes across the country. The group also referred to the clamor for the sack of the nation's service chiefs as unnecessary and will be counterproductive. It must be noted that Zamfara, Katsina and Tokoto used this strategy to solve insecurity problems last year. But does this work? Could it be another way of negotiating with terrorists? And Bishop of Sokoto Catholic Diocese, Matthew Kuka, has stated that President Mohamed Buhari is running the most nepotistic and narcissistic government in Nigeria's history. Joining me to discuss this this evening is Lolu Elegbe, political analyst and also legal practitioner Evans Ufeli. Thank you, gentlemen, for being on the show this evening. Thank you. Now, let's get talking. Is it okay for the federal government to get into negotiations with the stairs. Lulu, let me start with you. Um, well, it depends on what the negotiation is about. Okay. That's, I think that's the, that's the first thing. Now, <coughs> let, let me take your mind back. There was a period during the, um, the GEG administration where men, um, the Niger Delta Militants, they, mm -hmm. they came into some kind of um, agreement. Yeah. It was some kind of negotiation for them to seize the activities in the Niger Delta. Yeah, but uh, the, so that's what, that's what I mean by it depends on what that's about because yes. it's a slippery slope because okay. when you get to a point where you start to negotiate with with many of these people, what you're essentially saying to another group is that if you have, if you have the wherewithal to carry out enough violence, you will get a seat at the table. That's the, that's the other side, that's the flip side to having those sorts of discussions. But I say that um, admitting at the same time that there are times when you do have to have conversations with these people. I'm not sure, I don't think it's possible not to have those conversations. But I worry about the precedent that it sets when, because somebody picks up arms, starts to kill people, yes. and that sort of, quote unquote, wins him a seat at the table with whoever he, he ends up negotiating with. But I think what the government should be looking at doing is negotiating from a point of strength, not that these guys have beaten you to a wall, and because you're not sure what else to do, then yeah. you say, okay, let's talk instead of doing this. What they should be doing, I think, is going after these people as because at the end of the day, th these are criminals anyway. So going after them as much as possible. Um, when you get to a point where you've, you've hopefully beaten them back as much as you can, then you can have a conversation with them. Now, I think in, in the story mentioned that it had um, in Sokoto, Zamfara, and Katsina, I think Sokoto, Katsina. Yes. But um, the problems in Zamfara, for example, haven't, haven't stopped. We're still having this recurring um, yeah. incident of violence in Katsina as well. I haven't heard so much about Sokoto. Sokoto. So it's, and remember that we're not just talking about one group of bandits. There are several groups. So, I mean, who are you negotiating with exactly? Who are you having those conversations with? I think those things need to be clear okay. before the government comes to a point of saying, okay, let's have, um, let's have a dialogue and let's see how we can solve this. Evans, ourselves. are we there yet? to the point of negotiating with these terrorists. Do you think we're there yet? I don't think so. Okay. I, I think that group, they seem to be at lost uh, as regarding uh, what government should do in situations like this. Um, they gave some examples of Sokoto, Zamfara, Zamfara Katsina. and Castina. Um, in January, we had an outbreak of uh, this um, kind of attacks especially in Zamfara and then in Sokoto. We still had issues there. So um, I think that the approach government, need, these guys are violating the citizens. They are taking mining resources without a recourse to legal process. So we can safely say that they are economic saboteurs, they are criminals, they are bandits. So what should government do in that? I think government should do a total overhauling of the process and take them on, possibly exterminate them. But they've been doing that. They've been doing that. I mean, no, 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 they, haven't they been doing that? Government have not been serious with their approach, even the insurgency. 
uh, government have not been serious with it because if you look at these people, they are not trained uh, 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 soldiers. These are just criminals. And then with a proper military strategy or proper security arrangement, you should be able to intercept their source through intelligence and then have them, I mean, in the United States, America gets into another territory, another country to take out terrorists. We're talking about bandits within our territory. We're talking about people that we know in communities we know under a sovereign state. I mean, we, we, if we are serious, that's what I'm saying, if that is government is serious with it. There's no point because the president, and, and what would the you president term, you yeah, lay when sorry, you... Evan, sorry to cut you short. What would you term as seriousness? Now we're talking about an insurgency that has been on for years now. And it seems every time the, the federal government tells us they're winning, uh, they, they come out strong to let us know, you know what, we're still well yeah. capable to, to yeah. cause more havoc. Yes. Now, does this in any way depict our military as weak and in, inefficient in the operations? Not necessarily. Okay. But they may not be getting the strategy right because the federal government also work at cross purpose with the military. Uh, the federal government is in a haste to declare victory all the time. They tell you that they have technically defeated the insurgents. Yeah. And that erodes temporary solutions. The, 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 the solutions that they've been able to provide, their haste to declare victory, you know, puts the enemy on alert, puts the enemy on, on, on the side of strength to do more harm for the government to know that, I mean, their leader was killed almost seven, eight times. Yeah. We were told he has Second, been killed, he yes. has been killed. You understand? So I mean, if, if we are serious about it, if he has been killed, we should know when America took out uh, Osama bin Laden, in the moment he was killed, they brought out a tape roll, measure him, did the DNA test at the spot, confirmed it before they threw him into the sea. Do you understand? So then they told the world, we have taken him out. And since then, he has not resurfaced because he's been taken out. But here, we don't, we're not serious about this thing we are saying. That is what I'm saying. Until we become serious, then we will have a headway in this security issue. Lolo, do you totally subscribe to his opinion on this? Well, yeah, I think I agree with it mostly. Because I think the issue isn't so much a lack of seriousness. I think it's... It's different considerations. Okay, so the military is doing what the military does, right? They're going after these people with whatever infrastructure and weapons that they have, at, they have at the time. Is it enough? No, it's not, obviously, okay. because if it was, we wouldn't be in the situation we are today. Now, the problem is the government has a PR problem. And I think when they keep using terms like technically defeated, when they keep saying things like that or... You had, um, what's his name, Femi Adishino, yeah. saying one of the, I, I, don't, I don't use that kind of language, but a ridiculous statement saying that um, now the, the bombings used to be 10 before, now they're just two, so people should be thankful that they got, and I'm thinking, are you serious? This is a presidential spokesperson. Yeah. So when you start to hear those sorts of things, it gives the impression that the government is insensitive about what is going on. So I don't, that's why I said, I don't think it's so much seriousness. It's just that the agenda seem to be different. There's the political side of it, which is a reality that we cannot run away from okay. because part of the reason President Buhari got elected in 2015 was because he was able to leverage on his military background to say, you know what, I understand what's going on, I understand the security situation and I'm best placed to deal with this. And a lot of Nigerians responded to that and voted for him. But, and to be fair, yes, the, from what we had a year, two years before the 2015 election up until maybe two years ago, um, things actually improved on the Boko Haram front. But yeah. since then, it seems like it's been getting worse, not just with Boko Haram, but with banditry, with kidnapping, and it just seems to be spiral. Things seem to just be spiraling out, out, of, out control. of control. Right. Yeah. Let's let's take a look at the, um, the, the subtle act of negotiating with terrorists because mm. it's not um, it's not a new phenomenon. Sure. Yeah. All right. But 
um, are we prepared for that? Like you, 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 you made mention of some concerns, you mm. know, from this other group could now spring forward and say, you know what, if I can, if I can just cost me, I'm in a certain place, yep. maybe the, the government want to um, yep. have talks with me. So is the act of negotiation with this terrorist, what is obtainable in best practices? What are the strategies employed to make sure, you know, at the end of the day, when I go into negotiation with you, it mm. puts a stop to it completely? Yeah, so the, let me give an example. The US, for example, has this, policy laid down for decades that the US does not negotiate Never show with terrorists. terrorists. Oh, yes. But what a lot of what they don't say publicly is that while that's their public um, declaration or now that's the public um, um, that's what they say. Yeah. They have a lot of back channel discussions with these people. That's the reality. I mean the US for example has been having back channel conversations with the Taliban for years and not a lot of Americans knew that mm. but publicly they would say we don't negotiate with terrorists and and so the which is why I mentioned earlier that the reality is at some point you have to have a conversation with these people that's that's the reality but they do it the way they do it they do it from a position of strength they are not going to neg they're not going to have those conversations with you if bombs are raining down on their citizens you're killing them yeah. it won't happen that's the, I mean, what, what are, what, what's that negotiation going to be based on? That's the first thing. The second thing is, who exactly are you negotiating with? Because I think I remember, I think it was just around the time that President Buhari, no, not President, when the Chibok girls were kidnapped um, okay. under President G Jonathan. G yeah. And people were asking, people were saying that you need to negotiate with these guys to get the girls back. Now, Boko Haram at that time had a number of factions. So the question then becomes who exactly, even if you wanted to negotiate with these guys, who exactly would you be negotiating? You might be negotiating with the wrong faction. And whatever you agree with, I think there was something in the news at the time with them saying that they had reached a ceasefire with Boko Haram. And then another group said, no, we're the real Boko Haram. There's no ceasefire. So those are all the sort of intricacies that come into play. So it's not just a question of sitting down with people. It's about knowing who exactly yeah. you're sitting down with. And beyond that, you know who you're sitting down with. You're not doing it from a position of weakness at the same time. But beyond that, you need, it needs to be clear that um, once we have this conversation or once we have this deal in place, I mean, the negotiations happen. If you look at Colombia, for example, that's had a decades long civil yeah. war. At the end of the day, the government and the rebels had to sit down together. But the point is, when you get to that point to have that negotiation, the terms of whatever it is you're agreeing on need to be clear. But again, I go back to my original point, which is the problem with all that is that anyone else believes that if I can pick up guns and do X, Y, Z, uh, I can, okay, I, I want, I'm agitating for this. No one's listening to me. If I can somehow get my hands on yeah. weapons, gather yeah. some guys, yeah. do stuff, maybe they'll okay, listen let, to let, me. Let's take a look. What are alternatives? Because I believe before we come to the table to negotiate, we must have exhausted every means there is before we come to the table and say, you know, we want to have a negotiation with these people. What are the alternatives? The federal government, the Nigerian military seem not to be imploring at this point in time before we talk about the sort of act of negotiating with terrorists. Evans. Yes, first of all, we, we need to do a number of things. Um, we want to, first of all, find out what the concerns are. I mean, this bandit, what yeah. exactly are their grievances. Well, for Boko Haram, we, we knew at first they were against Western education, Western civilization, but now we can't really say, and, and this, this yeah, no, the, yes, the, now we can't really say what it is they're agitating that, for any longer. That, that was made clear then. Yes. Um, uh, it's still the same agitation because they are still saying they don't want Western education. So they have sustained that narrative. Even though, uh, even though I see it as a deceitful yeah, was narrative, say it's a, false narrative. Yeah, a false narrative, because if you look at the attacks they've yes. carried out over the years, uh, you will find out that um, it is not really tied to, mm. apart from the Chibo girls, uh, no other attack is really tied to uh, Western education yeah, or the claim, opposition yeah. of Western education. Now, coming to the bandits, what exactly? as their economic concern. What exactly do they want? First, we need to identify that. Who are these people? We need to come to terms with that. And then given our uh, identification crisis or confusion in Nigeria, how do we even get to know who these people are? Where do they come from? That's another thing. When do they attack? When do they get into the city or get into areas where they operate? 
who are the security forces in charge of that location? What do they do? How do they go about monitoring movement? The communities where they operate, how much of information do these people have about these persons that the government can extract information from? So we must do all this. And I think that by the time we're able to put our ass together and get deeply into the narrative or the conversation, uh, the need for negotiation may not be necessary. Okay. Now, Lulu said something while he was speaking earlier, because for, for negotiation to take place, we must be talking about it from a place of strength and yes. not necessarily where we are right now, because as where we are right now, it seems um, the insurgents, this, ban this bandits, uh, they, they are overpowering our military. And I'm concerned about the fact that wouldn't this portray our military as unequipped and ineffective? It will, if it will, if it, it goes on, it will, because already you have them hitting hard. Yes. Okay, on the military and then killing. I mean, if you now begin to negotiate with them at this juncture, it's negotiation from the point of weakness, from the point, okay, you know what, I don't want to lose more soldiers, so come around. And then you are, you are, you are leaving a precedence for, for because I see, you see, it is better to face them frontally than to have them on a round table on the on the on the part of weakness and then that set a precedent that we create further groups. Uh, when the Boko Haram started there was just one one sect, one fashion. Okay, their leader was killed. Before you know, they multiplied and then we now have different sects within the same organization. So we need to do what we ought to do frontally. Make sure that we're able to push them to the wall. Demonstrate to them that we can take them out. That if the need for a roundtable discussion arise in the process, then we cannot be talking from a point of strength. Well, right, aside the the marriage that you, you listed earlier on while speaking, um, other factions might come and say, you know, once we can just get arms and cost me, and yeah, the federal government might, might want to sit with us. What what other demerits are there, just in case the federal government should decide to go into negotiations, indeed, with this with this bandit? No, I think it just creates the it creates for, I think it creates the impression that violence wins. That's the, and I think that's a very dangerous very, very dangerous perception to create anywhere. Because if somebody, if somebody has to use violence to get your attention, then you're already in a bad place, regardless of how it ends. Yes. You're, you're already in a very bad place. And that's my, I think that's my major it's worry. It's not a win-win. It. No, it's, it's it not. Can't it, be a win it cannot be a win-win. <laughs> because, and I think if that's the case, then, I mean, the, I mean, the, the bandits in, in these, other places, I, again, I don't know what their issues are, whether it's mining, whether it's just poverty, whether, whether it's religious, education, whatever the issue is. I think it speaks to a wider concern within the country, which is that there's so many things we're not getting right in the country. Different groups feel, for whatever reason, rightly or, or, or wrongly, feel disenfranchised for some reason. The reasons might be manufactured, the reasons might be real, that's not the point. But the fact is that they feel that way. And as long as Nigeria has one of the, one of the youngest populations in the world, and if we're not careful, these sorts of things will just be recurring as long as Nigeria remains one country. Because mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is when you have youths that don't know what they're going to be doing tomorrow, where they're going to be two years from now, they're not in school. They have, even if they're in school, um, schools go on. There are all sorts of reasons where, why these things happen. And if we don't deal with these things, we're just creating generations of bandits and generations of people that will resort to violence okay. e um, eventually. And that's, I, I think that scares me more okay. than anything else. All right. All right. The group has also come out to argue the fact that the mm. call, the clamor for the service chiefs to be sacked is mm. unnecessary and will be counterproductive to the fight against insurgency. Do you, do you, do you agree with them on that? No, I think, see, I don't think the issue is, for, for me, I think that's a disingenuous statement from them, to be honest, because, um, now, this group are saying that, um, I, I think I read a state, parts of their statement with them saying that if you sack the service chiefs, things will get worse. And, yeah. and that doesn't make sense to me. First of all, I don't believe that sacking the service chiefs is the right call anyway. I don't believe that. But at the same time, them saying that things will get, why would things get worse? It's not like the president is going to remove the service chiefs and then leave those positions um, open. Vacant. Obviously, he's going to put new people yeah. in there. So I'm not quite I'm not quite sure what they mean by things will get worse. 
But on the other hand, on the flip side, I actually don't see how, I don't believe that the service chiefs are the problem. I don't, I don't think they're the issue because if you remove all of them today and you replace them with new people, are we saying that that suddenly changes the trajectory of the insecurity that happens? I don't believe it will because the issues that they have, the issues that the military have, whether it's funding, infrastructure, weaponry, whatever yeah. it is, those factors will still be there, okay, even so, with new so service. The chiefs. question begs, the question begs, and then what mm. are the alternatives to sacking of the service chiefs? Evans? Well, I, uh, I, I think um, taking them out, let me, let me, taking them out is what I, what I think is the way out. Uh, because, you see, the call to take them out is not because, largely, that they have failed which is obvious they failed, but not largely so, is also that their tenure is expired. They okay, do no longer point. have ideas to pursue this thing. So you see, and apart from that, apart from the fact that their tenure is expired, is a military practice, tradition. You change guards. And each time you do that, it energizes and strengthens the call for duty. You understand? So we must do it at this juncture because um, we have had situations in this country where the competence of this guy have been put to test, stretched, and they have been found wanted. Anywhere in the world where a manager is underperforming, the company is going down the drain. They will take the manager, whether it's in football, whether it's in manufacturing, wherever. So I think they should be, they should, let's take them out. And then let's get other persons to deploy the, the strategy to tame this situation. All right. Just now, let's, if quickly, in just a few minutes, let's, let's point on the, on the statement credited to Bishop Cooker in which he berated President Mahmoud Buhari. And I quote, he said, the president is running the most nepotistic and narcissistic government in Nigeria's history. He also accused the president of bringing nepotism and clannishness into the military and the country's security agencies. Do you agree with him on this statement? Well, he's not totally wrong. Okay. Um, I think the, the, pro the problem with this administration is that they don't seem to understand the power of perception. I, I don't think they understand it at all. And I, I've said it a number of times that I think um, President Jonathan lost the election because he also did not understand the power of perception. Because the reality is that whatever, where, even if President Buhari or the people around him are not thinking in that direction, the fact of the matter is their actions, that's what their actions look like. That's what it speaks to. That's yeah. what it looks like to anybody, to any neutral observer. So when you, when you look at the security architecture of the country, for example, and you look at the list of names, don't get me wrong, these are qualified people. I'm not for one second um, implying that they're not. But when you have a country as diverse, as Nigeria, and then you have most, about 90% or maybe more of the security, of the people that head the security agencies in this country being from a part of the country. Yeah. It creates a perception. I personally, to be honest, I personally don't care if all the security chiefs come from Dara. I, I really can, as long as they're doing a good job, I really don't care. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is we live in a country where these perceptions take root. And once they do, it becomes hard for, it, it affects the president's credibility, and I don't think that's something that he, he still understands yet. All right, Evans, quickly, your reaction to yeah, yeah. Ordin or he just said, yeah. Ordinarily, it shouldn't have been a problem if uh, we, we have them performing optimally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But where you have uh, this level of incompetence, and then you also have even a law, you have a law, the federal character, how useless that provision of law is, is a law, okay, a part of the constitution that the president or to you know, act the, uh, accordingly. But he has violated all that. And then he creates this uh, uh, clannish tendency. Uh, for the first time in Nigeria, the president can step out from his house, speak outside to the person at, from, from point A, point B, C, D to the, to the last. Because it, it is a lopsided uh, 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 way of making appointment that does not uh, really show that it's a president of the entire country. Okay, so and what uh, the bishop said is just uh, uh, right. Lulu Elegbe and Evans Philly, thank you very much for your contributions in this segment. Thank you. We'll take a short break now. The latest development on Amatekun is up next. Do stay with us.